ship, the USS Guadalcanal, fresh out of the Kaiser Yard, equipped from stem to stern with the products of American ingenuity, turned out by your hands, electronic devices, radar, submarine detectors, wildcats and avengers, guns and shells, the thousand and one items that in the hands of American boys make a fighting American ship. All under the command of Captain Dan Gallery, USN, a pioneer of naval aviation. On May 15, 1944, a task group of the Atlantic Fleet heads out to sea with orders to operate against submarines to the west of the Cape Verde Islands. The group comprises the USS Guadalcanal and her five destroyer escorts. The Pillsbury, the Chatelaine, the Pope, the Flaherty, and the Jenks. At the departure conference, Captain Gallery and the destroyer skippers decide upon a daring plan of action. If, during this cruise, they can bring a sub to bay, they will not attempt to sink her as soon as she surfaces. Instead, they will spray her with small stuff, put crews over the side in small boats, and attempt to board and capture her. Daring, did we say? Fantastic is the word for boarding a wounded U-boat on the high seas. But the prize would be priceless. Naval intelligence could use a completely equipped enemy vessel. So during the voyage, prize crews were trained and rehearsed for this bold hope. Here's the hand-picked boarding party of the Guadalcanal. Let's meet some of them. Chief photographer's mate, Clifford Whirla. His job will be to get inside the sub, take pictures of all installations in case she cannot be kept afloat. Chief pharmacist, Raymond Jackson, Fredericksburg, Virginia. He served 10 years in the Navy. Lieutenant J.G. Milo Keck, a veteran sea dog with 25 years naval experience. Ensign Fred Middaw, an electrician's mate first class, William Stein. Stein, a crack electrician, will assist Ensign Middaw in the job of checking the batteries and all operating motors of the enemy vessel. Ensign James Griffin, and machinist mate second class, Walter Waller. Ensign Griffin will check the sub's diesel engine. Waller is to be engineer of the party's whaleboat. In command of the boarding and salvage party is Commander Earl Trocino engineering officer of the Guadalcanal. Over on the USS Pillsbury, a similar party is being trained by Lieutenant Albert David. On June 4th, 1944, the task group is searching for a sub reported 150 miles off the coast of French West Africa, when suddenly at 11.10... Frenchy to Blue Jay, I have a possible sound contact. Nothing startling for the moment. Possible sound contacts are made every day, but a flat top has no business near them. With her high freeboard and her thin skin, she is a sitting duck for any sub which surfaces within torpedo range. So the Guadalcanal swings away, while the two nearest destroyers break off to assist the Chatelaine, which has made the sound contact. And the Guadalcanal's patrol of two Wildcat fighters is ordered to the scene. Then Commander Knox of the Chatelaine announces, Contact evaluated as sub and making attack. Almost simultaneously, both fighter planes sight the long, dark shape of the submarine running 60 feet below the surface and sing out, Sighted sub. At this point, the sub reverses course, temporarily shaking off the destroyer. But the Wildcats can see the sub and reveal its position by firing their guns in the water at the spot where the sub is disappearing. This is a remarkable example of aircraft actually directing the attack of a surface vessel on a U-boat. At 11.21, the destroyer makes a depth charge attack. All ships are at battle stations, and all eyes are glued on the Chatelaine. The guns of the task group are loaded with anti-personnel rather than armor-piercing ammunition. At 11.22 and a half, the wounded U-boat surfaces right in the middle of the task group. Commence firing. 
The planes open up first. Now the blow really begins. Pour it on, lad. Nazis are scrambling overboard. There are the Nazis in the water in their rubber rafts. But there may be more on board ready for business. Away all boarding parties. rudder is jammed, and she is running in a tight circle to the right. But the planes are all set to open up if she makes a false move. This is it. For the first time since 1815, the United States Navy boards a foreign enemy man of war on the high seas. The first boarding party has swarmed aboard. Only one dead Nazi on deck. There may be live ones below. But our lads tumble down the hatch and find to their amazement that the U-505 is all theirs. All theirs, that is, if she doesn't sink or blow up. Here comes the Pillsbury making knots. And there's a second whale boat with a boarding party from the Guadalcanal. The Nazis have done a hurried, frantic job of scuttling. A solid eight-inch stream of water is pouring through an open stream. But Lieutenant David and his boys find the cover, slap it back in place, and secure it just in time. A few minutes more, and it would have been too late. The inrush of water is checked. Each man has a different job to do, has rehearsed it for months. And now that the chips are down, they come through. The ship is thoroughly searched. But she's still running wild, and the Pillsbury and more boarders are chasing her. Finally, the Pillsbury order stop sub's engine. But when the prize crew complies, the subs sink so alarmingly that they throw the switches to full speed ahead, and the chase begins all over again. Meanwhile, the Chatelaine is busy rescuing some very wet members of the master race. Amazingly, all but one are saved and brought on board the Chatelaine. Dry clothing and cigarettes are passed around. The tradition of the sea is honorably and punctiliously respected. These men are the cream of the German Navy. They just can't believe that their ship has been captured and by members of a decadent democracy. At last, the Pillsbury comes alongside and passes a line to the boarding party, a neat bit of seamanship. But watch out. That sub is still as dangerous as a wounded shark. She swings into the Pillsbury, and her bow flippers rip a long underwater gash in the DE's thin plates, flooding two main compartments clear up to the waterline. The destroyer has to cut loose and back clear. The Pillsbury radios. Sub says she has to be told to stay afloat, but we don't think a destroyer can do it. So the Guadalcanal heads over and says on the TBS, destroyers stand clear. I am going to take her in tow myself. Now we'll see whether this aviator skipper can handle the ship. 
It's a ticklish job hooking a flat top to a sinking sub on the high seas and in the middle of the Atlantic U-boat lanes. Look how far down she is. They've closed the hatch to keep the swells from pouring down on the boys working inside. If she goes down now, they all go down with her. Let's get that line out. There it goes, the messenger line with a big tow line at the end of it. This is a job to test the mettle of veteran seamen. And four out of five of those boys on the sub's forecastle are green. But there is no fumbling. The anxious skipper heaves a sigh of relief as the sub makes way and rises in the water. She is safe again, for the time being, and under a new flag. The task group forms up and on orders from the Navy Department heads for Bermuda, a grueling 2,500 mile haul with a riddled waterlogged U-boat in tow. Normal flight operations are resumed and carried on day and night, despite the greatly reduced speed of the Guadalcanal. At times, there are only 15 knots of wind across the flight deck, and it's axiomatic that a flyer has to have 25 knots to land on a baby flat top. But these pilots land anyway, and without an accident. The prisoners are transferred from the overcrowded destroyer to the carrier. The one in the stretcher is Oberleutnant Zerzi Herolang, captain of the U-505. The first man out of the conning tower. He was instantly blown overboard by a shell. During the voyage, they're brought on deck for exercises. and a thorough salt shower. On the 7th of June, the fleet tug of Naki joins up and the tow is transferred from the Guadalcanal. Now comes the most anxious moment of the cruise. As she loses way, Junior, as the crew have christened the sub, sinks lower and lower in the water. The salvage party works desperately to take all movable weights out of the U-boat. Then, as the transfer is completed and the Abnaki gets underway, the clutches on the sub's engines are released and her propellers recharge her batteries. With power aboard, her pumps work once more and her tanks are blown out. Now she rides again at full surface trim. On June 19th, the U-505 was towed into Bermuda and there remains as a prize of war, one less wolf to hunt with the pack.
time requirement of more than 5 million tons per year. It is apparent that the steel industry is directly dependent on the availability of merchant shipping. Thus, the state of health of steel production could be said to be directly dependent on the operation of United States submarines. Japan's chief supply of oil came from America in the years prior to the war. Therefore, since the war started, our water requirements, which amounted to about 5 million tons a year, had to be supplied mostly from the Dutch East Indies. One of the decisive factors in our defeat was the activities of American submarines which cut off the supply from that source entirely. Our records show that about 36% of the major vessels, that is vessels larger than destroyers, while lost to the United States submarine. Actually, Admiral Nagano is pretty accurate in his estimate. The latest reports, and we've checked and double-checked them, show that one battleship, nine carriers, and 15 cruisers of the Imperial Japanese Navy were sunk by Allied submarines. He might have added, though, that 42 destroyers and 28 submarines were sunk in the same way. Not a bad few years' work. By the way, I noticed the Admiral didn't give any figures on their merchant marine. Well, that's understandable. It must be quite a painful subject to him. There just isn't any more Japanese merchant marine. Our submarines accounted for 63% of that important branch. Mr. Nomura probably could have told you that the 104 of his vitally needed tankers were victims of submarines. Their merchant marine was destroyed on the high seas, in the ports of the Japanese Empire, and even in the shallow waters off the China coast, where the submarines had to operate as PT boats since there was insufficient water for diving. Admiral, do you think in these articles we're writing, we could explain why, during the war, there was so little publicity given our subs and the shellacking they were handing the Japs? I wish you would. It was just something that couldn't be helped. At the beginning of the war, some divisions visited the front and then broke into print and they got back about how American submarines didn't fear Japanese destroyers. They boasted that the nip depth charges weren't big enough to hurt us and weren't set deep enough to reach us. You can imagine how joyful the Jap received that news. They radically changed their tactics and they lost, I should say, about 10 submarines with all on board before we can prove our construction sufficiently to slow the Jap down. Is that when you became the silent service? Right then and there. We buttoned up our lips and said with torpedoes. Besides, there was too much work to do to permit talking about it. Just visualize the spot we were in, December 7th, 1941. There wasn't time to be bitter. It was up to us, the small ships. The big ones were out of the picture. Yesterday, December 7th, 1941, a date which will live in infamy. The United States of America was suddenly and deliberately attacked by naval and air forces of the Empire of Japan. Yes, it was up to the submarine. At that time, we had exactly 51 submarines in the Pacific, and that included 12 of the old S-class. Small and slow, but they gave a good account of themselves. On December 15th, eight days after Pearl Harbor, American subs drew their first blood. A swordfish was cruising off Hainan Island in the South China Sea. On the radio, they could hear the voice of a Japanese woman speaking faultless English. Later, she would become famous as Tokyo Rose. 
We know very well that American submarines have headed west from Pearl Harbor. If American submariners are wise, you will turn back. Certain death awaits you over here. And now I'll play for you unfortunate Americans a popular recording. One week after Pearl Harbor, the Atsutu San Maru, 8,663 tons, became the first victim of an American sub. A dubious honor. It wasn't long before she had plenty of company at the bottom of the ocean. On the 1st of January, the 5,384-ton Tainan Maru was sunk right off the very coast of Japan. But those early days were tough. Just look at the vast amount of territory the Japs overran in no time at all. Naturally, they wanted to consolidate, keep all that loot from the conquered territories pouring into Japan. Fuel, oil, rubber, coal, iron, rice. It was our job to see that most of that loot didn't get there. And for 18 months, our subs were the only ships that penetrated enemy-controlled sea lanes. It was rugged, but it paid off. Let the Japs tell you about it. American submarines in 1944 sank 134 Japanese merchant ships, totaling 580,000 or 390 tons and 140,000 tons of men of war. And that was only beginning. Yes, only the beginning. Even newly commissioned subs got big scores. For instance, the trigger. Her story starts in Mare Island. That's the way she looked at me the first time I ever saw her. I was reporting as mess attendant. Got to be officer's cook first class time I was transferred. She didn't look like nothing much to me right then. Just a lot of pipe and steel. No life, no spirit. But I felt a little better when I saw the galley. Small but clean. The latest in devices. A man sure could get a mess of cooking done in there. But all in all, I sure felt let down. I said to myself, man, what possessed you to volunteer for the subservice anyhow? Next time, you'll keep your big mouth shut. I began to feel a little better, though, about the trigger when we got underway. There was just something about it. Well, by the time we reached Pearl, the trigger and me was friends. She sure won me over. How'd you do it? Well, well I tell you, shippers. Well, it's like our tech says. He says, I don't find it any easier than the steward to put into words what I feel about the trigger. I think it's that all ships have souls, and all sailors know it. But it takes a while to learn to commune with it. It took me quite some time. But when it happened, it was our first patrol and our first kill. Off the eastern coast of Kyushu, a good-sized freighter. Clear the bridge. Take her down before we're spotted. That baby might mount enough guns to blast us to kingdom come. Take her down. That's the good, sir. Let's take a look to see if she spotted us. Everything looks normal from here. If it isn't a trap. She might be a Q-ship carrying depth charges and sound gear. We can't hit her till we close the range. To close the range, we've got to watch out that she doesn't see or hear us. Or the killer will become the cook. The minutes seem like hours until we get into position. Easy, easy, then estimated range, 1,500 yards, track 90 port, tower angle five left, stand by. It's coming on, coming on, fire one. Then eight seconds, fire two. Trigger had 
come of age. But she was soon to face her first ordeal. Death charging. Several nights later, we heard Tokyo Rose on our radio. I regret to inform all American submarines that one of their number has recently fallen victim to a destroyer of the Imperial Japanese Navy. You will hear an appropriate recording. <laughs> Control six three feet. Control six three feet. Forward torpedo room. Make ready all tubes. Forward torpedo room. Make ready all tubes. Set depth twelve feet. Set depth twelve feet. Rate for silent running. Rate for silent running. Rate for depth charge. Rate for depth charge. Steady on two five zero. Oh. All ahead one third. All ahead one third. How much time I got? None, sir. Torpedo run one one double O. Oh. Range about one six double O. Oh. Gyro zero zero five increasing. Shoot any time. Stand by forward. Stand by forward. Up periscope. Check bearing and shoot. Bearing. Mark. D45. Down periscope. Set. Fire. Fire one. One fire, sir. Fire. Fire two. Two fires. Fire. Fire three. Three fires. Set. The trigger, of course, was subjected to another terrific death charge. There were moments when no one on board thought she'd come through. But she stood up and eventually got away. The carrier just managed to crawl back to Tokyo Bay, badly crippled. The trigger was lost in March 45 off the Ryukyus. At that time, she was one of the highest ranking subs in tonnage and total number of ships sunk. The trigger will never be forgotten. Nor will the work of all our other submarines. In 1943, 284 Japanese ships totaling 1,341,968 tons, 
Bush, about 100,000 tons of warships were sunk by American submarines. Naturally, they got some of our subs, too. But our losses weren't excessive when you consider what was accomplished. In fact, they were quite small compared to the losses of the Jap and German submarine services. But we felt deeply each individual loss. For instance, take the case of the Sculpin. On 19 November 1943, we sighted a fast convoy and made an attack. Their screen detected us and immediately subjected us to depth charging. Things were getting tough when we heard a rain squall. We headed for it and shook the jet. At least we thought we did. But the moment we regained periscope depth, we found that jet destroyer sitting right in our lap. We tried to duck, but he has heard as well as seen it. the batteries were almost flat and the men completely exhausted. We had a tough decision to make. The first concern of our skipper, Commander Conaway, was for the life of his men. We had on board the wolf pack commander, Captain Cromwell, who had heard that the Japs used a special brand of torture to extract information from their captives. Suddenly, a decision was reached. We battled service and used our deck gun to fight it out with the destroyer. and Lieutenant DeFreeze were killed almost instantly. I succeeded to command. The situation was hopeless. I gave the order to scuttle ship. Captain Cromwell chose to go down with the boat because he knew too much. Ensign Max Fiedler also went down with the sculpin. for a change. It was a very pleasant phase to our activity. Patrols were tough on bodies and nerves, so we arranged a program of relaxation and rehabilitation between runs that was the envy of every branch of service. With the approval and backing of Fleet Admiral Nimitz, our Commander-in-Chief, we took over the Royal Hawaiian Hotel in Honolulu, lock, stock, and barrel, and we said to the submarine men, it's all yours. 
Other operating forces also had quotas at the Royal, for it held about 150 officers and 1,000 men. But the majority were always submarine men and aviators from the carrier groups. I guess the Royal Hawaiian was one of the reasons there was a waiting list for sub-duty. It almost seems like the more rest and fun our men had, the more damage they did to the Jap fleet. And that's understandable, too, for they went to sea mentally and physically fit and trained to meet any type of combat. Just take the figures for 44. In 1944, 429 merchant ships, totaling 2,387,000, 788 tons were destroyed by your sub. In addition, about 500,000 tons of warships were sunk. Now, these figures for merchant ships include only ships of 1,000 tons or larger. The smaller ships sunk by your sub, chiefly by gunfire, were too numerous to count. Jap fleet was just about shot. In fact, by 1945, targets were getting awfully scarce and awfully small. What was left of Jap shipping tried desperately to crawl home, hugging the coasts. But our subs went right after them, right into the dangerous shallow water, right along the China coast and into the mine-filled Yellow Sea. We gave them no rest. This was about the time of the big carrier strikes and the B-29 raids in the homeland, which brings up another interesting phase of submarine work lifeguard duty. That is, the picking up of our downed aviators. We had quite an air-sea rescue system worked out. It didn't get much publicity because we didn't want the Japs to know about it. I'm an electrician's mate second class. Of course, that means I don't get to see much topside action, so the other day I says to the chief, I says, um, hey chief, how about me getting on the gun crew? He thought I was kind of crazy wanting to be topside with the others, but he finally gave in, and here I am. Hey, this is beginning to be more like it. One load of fish that won't end up in Jap belly. How about this? Prisoners. Welcome aboard, boys. You'll find conditions a little cramped, but we'll treat you right, feed you well, even though you don't deserve it. I'd always heard that Japs would, would rather die than be taken prisoner, but these guys don't seem to object to our rescue efforts. Wait a minute. We've got something. A B-29 is in trouble. We've got him on radar, but the lookouts haven't spotted him yet. Say, this lifeguard stuff is new to me, but it has its exciting moments. Brother, am I glad I'm not on that plane. Well... Here's a couple that were lucky enough to jump. We're going over to pick them up and, and then survey the wreckage to see if there are others we can rescue. Maybe we'll find some still alive. This job of dragging tired and half-drowned pilots aboard a sub looks easy, but 
It takes careful handling and a, a certain amount of risk on the part of our own boy. Climbing up the side of a slippery otter hole and super stretcher in a choppy sea isn't easy, even for one of our own men. So it gets a bit complicated when these zoomies drop in on us. Say, these guys look like they're badly shot up. Doc is up here now, and first aid is being given to those who need it right away. There isn't time for treating for shock and exposure on deck because we're in enemy waters and subject to attack at any moment, so Skipper says to get them below as soon as possible. Here we are now, down in the cheese quarter. Doc has made this compartment into a first-class operating room. Looks like we're going to have more company in a few minutes. You know, this picking up a flyer is getting to be quite a habit with us. Of course, most of the guys here on the sub would rather be firing fish or the deck guns, but it's a great feeling to be able to rescue a small bunch of fellows like these, and, and it's a relief to have somebody new to swap yarns with after being out here for so long. Sometimes the, the kid you and I used to know back home isn't so lucky. We're doing all we can. No sign yet, but we're not giving up. Well, we tried, but he didn't make it. But we'll make it up to him. We'll save as many of his buddies as we can. Yes, many of that boy's buddies were saved. At one time, we had 22 submarines on station whose primary duty was lifeguarding. All in all, we rescued more than 500 Army, Navy, and Marine aviators. The submarines were proud of that work and eager for the assignment. But in the last months of the war, it didn't supply enough action to satisfy them. So, as you'll see, they figured out some special assignments for themselves. And very interesting, too. During the summer of 45, the Tarantia was in the same fix as all the other subs. No targets really worth wasting the taxpayers' torpedoes on. Oh, we managed to amuse ourselves. We shot up a few picket boats and other small craft. Knocked off a sea truck. Raised some mild hell in a general way. We played pirate and boarded some junks. Scared the crews half out of their yellow skins and gave the deep six to a lot of dried peas bound for Japan. took a few prisoners. Exploded some mines. That there was nothing to write home about, even if we could have written home. Then one morning, we sighted a ship in the distance. It looked like it was tied to a dock alongside a cargo. We kept it under observation for about an hour. like a two or three thousand ton freighter taking on coal by conveyor. We held a war council. It'd be risky entering a harbor full of rocks and shoals. Should we try it? Well, we didn't come out here to sit on our duffs. We changed course. Then the skipper, as he always did, spoke to the crew. Thomas, I think you might like to know what we're up to. There's a two or three thousand ton freighter in the harbor tied to a colliery dock, taking on coal. That's the biggest ship we've seen so far, and targets are too scarce these days to let any pass. On the good side of the ledger, I can mention these two items. One, there seems to be a lack of patrol craft in this spot, and two, I don't think there are any mines because there's an awful lot of small craft around. Now, on the bad side of the ledger, the harbor's full of rocks and shoals, and navigation's going to be tough. We'll make a submerged attack, but then we'll have to service and have it out. If we're caught in here submerged, it'll be just too bad. However, we have the best navigator in the business. So what are we waiting for? Let's go. Battle stage is submerged. We got into position, went through the preliminaries. 
Let me tell you, right here and now, when the real thing comes up, it's like nothing you ever went through in your life. When that scope goes up in this harbor, you're playing for keeps. Your blood pressure tells you that. The sweat on your hands and the butterfly in your chest keep reminding you that when you get within a thousand yards of your target, you're going to let go with everything you've got. Then get, if you can. The exact look confirms it. We're dead on. And coming closer. Closer. Dozens of small craft crisscrossing overhead. If one of them sights our scope while the skipper's taking cuts to keep us off the rocks, you can make like the song and kiss the boys goodbye. Now, coming on a thousand yards. Twenty to go. Ten. Five. Fire one. Them scramble. Nuts. She's listening to port and down by the bow, but still afloat. Hey, wait a minute. They manned their deck gun there on the right. Looks like they think a plane got them. But we can't surface while that gun's still in business. All right, then, let her have another fish. Just ahead of the stack. Polish off ship and gun crew both with one blow. Fire two! Swing left again. Sonar reports fish ran true, but suddenly stopped. No explosion. Must have buried itself in a mud bank or a torpedo net. But there's not time to speculate. The NIP gun crew spotted our periscope. They're taking pot shots at us. Better slip them another fish, and quick. Steady on 280. Torpedo run, 750. Depth set, two feet. Gyro angle, 038. Fire three. Bullseye. And now, as Shakespeare said, let's not stand upon the order of our going, but let's go. Got a nerve shooting at us. What kind of hospitality do they call that? All right, now let's show some speed. Wait a minute. We must have surfaced too fast. The bow plane should have folded up like a fighter plane's wings. Stuck out like that, they'll drag our speed down till the Japs can catch us with a rowboat. And that's not all that can catch us. Come up, come up. There. Steady as you go, sweethearts. Now we can highball for deep water. But the Jap fire is getting closer. I'm beginning to sweat again. Well, here we are getting the decoration. So I guess we made it all right. But believe me, it was close. That was months ago, but I've just about now stopped sweating. The Power and Light Company is going to seem awfully beautiful in a few weeks when they hand me that ruptured duck. But, brother, how I'm going to miss this boat and the boys. Yes, we rewarded our men in the submarine. Tried to honor them for the heroic things they had done. But nothing we can do, nothing we can say can properly express our gratitude to these men of the silent service. And of the men who did not come back, the men who went down with their ships, what can we say? How can we repay them? 
Shall we not echo their prayer? May God grant that there be no next war. But they know and we know that if there is, and whether it be fought with weapons we now know or with weapons at whose nature we can only guess, you will find submarines in the thick of the combat, fighting with skill, determination, and matchless daring, doing their utmost for all of us, for our United States of America.